Thank you all. Now, ca can you hear me when I speak like this in the back? Yeah, I think two thumbs up. Okay, wonderful. Um, what can I say? It's uh, it's great to see on a Thursday afternoon. Thursday, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thursday afternoon at six o'clock that you all came here for this uh, this this topic that seems to to draw a lot of attention. Uh, the, the whole psychedelics. Uh, like Monday, I was in a psychedelic science cafe in Utrecht, and we had a we had a full house on on uh, on, a psych on drugs in what was psychedelic drugs. I think that was the title. And to see you here um, is 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 great. But also at the same time, I'm wondering like wh what draws you to this. And we could do a poll here. I have sort of an idea of what draws you to this, and I hope that we can engage maybe during or after to see if I can tap into this, because I only focus this from a particular perspective, which is psychotrauma. Because I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a clinical psychiatrist. In my daily life, I, I see patients. So I, I come to the area of, let me call it psychedelics from a medical perspective, from a treatment perspective. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm working at the, uh, to give, give you some perspective of who, am I, who I am, and then I'll, I'll walk you through what I will cover in the next sort of 40, 45 minutes or so. Maybe more because we have until eight, right? So, oh, so we'll, we'll see. <laughs> but it'd be good to engage in in, in w whenever you 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 have concerns or questions or so. Interrupt since we're a small enough crowd to have to have a discussion as as we as we as we move on. Now I'm I'm um, actually my employer is the Dutch Department of Defense. It's a typically. I'm wearing a civilian uniform, but also wearing a military uniform because I'm an officer in the Dutch Armed Forces uh, with a rank. I'm a ranked in colonel, and um, I joined the forces relatively late in my career. Uh, but my, my daily life, I see soldiers, and I see veterans. And you know veterans, we send veterans to areas where they can be uh, uh, exposed to violence, uh, uh, trauma, war trauma, and typically when they come back, they carry on with their lives, but sometimes it's hard to carry on with life after you've witnessed some atrocities that we, we, we hear from them. So then I treat them uh, for a disorder that we currently know as post-traumatic stress disorder. And we have several treatments, and I'll, I'll walk you through that area, how it developed itself, and actually where realities, maybe new realities may occur. For them, the world is a different place after they've been exposed to psychotrauma. So can we bring a new reality back to their life is sort of the, the quest, the, the holy grail at the same time. So Dutch defense, but I'm also working uh, as a professor of psychiatry at Leiden University Medical Center. And um, I'm also working uh, at ARC Psychotrauma Expert Group, which is uh, just next door in, in Demon. So there's kind of three employers that, um, that keep me grounded and pay my salary. And, um, and, and well, actually, what 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 uh, what um, what my professorship sort of entails is um, is um, can we can we do better? Is in the shortcut. Can we do better? Is what do we currently have? It's not that I have the best truth in mind, but we know what opportunities we have in psychotrauma, and the challenge is, can we do better? And what you'll hear me say is going forward actually is looking back. And I'll just mention one word is repurposing. Does that ring you a bell? Repurposing? Maybe we have compounds in our pockets that we have had to stall <laughs> and we're now playing back on the clinical area. So that said, let me see if I can press this button. Then, um, Actually, I gave, I gave a talk um, last week at the Leiden <coughs> DS, which is the, what is it now? It's the 444th year of Leiden University. It's celebrating uh, that, that year, and I was asked to give a presentation there for the alumni meeting, and there were a couple of people, the general audience, the, the average age of the person in the audience was double, I think, <laughs> here, and they recognized this picture very, very well, very easy. Now, I don't think that you will not recognize it, but maybe a little bit harder. Who, who, do, who, who does recognize this picture? Who wants to dare? Who doesn't? Sorry, what? Who doesn't or 
Who doesn't? Yeah, right. Well, this is, I mean, maybe you can read this. This says here Canada. This is actually May 1945, liberation of the Netherlands. And I come from a generation, that's why I want to show this picture. I grew up in a household <coughs> where my parents were very much exposed to the Second World War. And in my daily life, as I grew up, the stories of war or the absence of war was very prevalent at the dinner table. And, and the embodiment of war trauma has also, not only in my household, been very prevalent in our society. I mean, we live in a society we're celebrating next year, 75 days of, uh, after this liberation. We've been in peace for most of the time, but there's a lot of people, actually our generations before us, that were more scared and were occupied, living under the occupied area. So that's kind of the, kind of something that I always feel when you travel in the Netherlands, so many mem memories and memorabilia of, of this time where we were, we were, our reality was different than the reality of freedom. Now, the person that uh, has been a pioneer of, um, of, the, um, of the landscape of psychotrauma was this guy, who does not recognize this person, I would almost say. Who, 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 well, it says there on the top, right? It says Bastians, Jan Bastians. Jan Bastians was a professor of psychiatry at Leiden University. He was head of psychiatry. And um, here's an E in his last days. And uh, he wrote a beautiful book, if you want to read a, bu a book in Dutch, it's called Isolement and Befriding, Isolation and Liberation. And he, this is about 20 years after the war where people were stuck with these memories of the concentration camps that they'd been held in. And their life was kind of frozen around those memories. Their life was not the same as it, as, as it was before. And he, he wanted to, with a group of people, actually help people get unstuck, get access to those memories. They could not even verbalize those memories. They were kind of hidden, frozen. But they relived those memories every day in their bedrooms because then their nightmares came out and, and they enacted on their, their memories. And what he did was he used LSD. He was the pioneer in the Netherlands to use LSD to help people give a new platform for those memories that were inaccessible in verbal psychotherapies. And, um, and there's a beautiful um, documentary, two documentaries actually made by a Dutch uh, cineast uh, with the name of Louis van Gasseren. Who, who, who does know Louis van Gasseren? Louis Gasserin died two years ago, and he, um, he, f he made a, a movie called Begrijpt u nu waarom ik huil? Do you understand why I'm crying? And uh, he portrayed this guy who was being treated by Jan Bastians. And, um, and there's a beautiful quote in that movie where his wife, and this is not about PTSD per se, but where his wife, in the movie says, how can I have nightmares of a concentration camp where I have not been? And we hear, how can I have memories of a concentration camp where I have not been? So it tells a story about intergenerational trauma and how profoundly that trauma can be prevalent in, in the lives of others. Now, he tried to use LSD and um, just an anecdote or so, it doesn't have direct relationship, but I do like to share how connected you can feel to a history of this. this. I was 11 years old when that movie actually was shown in, this was 1972, in the, uh, in the Parliament of the Netherlands, because at that time we needed to come into terms with what do we do with the, um, with the SS, the Nazis. And we had three at Nazis in the, in the city where I grew up in Breda, and they were captivated there for li life sentence. And do we, do we forgive them now, or sort of do we let them, do we let them go, or do we need to keep them in, in prison? And in 1972, this film was shown where Dries van Acht was at time, that time our prime minister to help uh, the people to, to kind of familiarize ourselves with, okay, what do we do? Where are we in terms of psychotrauma? Where do we, do we need to punish them or do we need to let them go? And, and, and um, that public domain was, was very interesting <laughs> at that time. Now, and this, this m documentary helped to stimulate uh, how, how the suffering 
of people who had been in concentration camp was very prevalent. Now the other angle is the use of LSD. Um, there's another one uh, that, that Louis van Hasselen made in 1993, which was when he had passed away and he filmed the children of, of this, uh, this man. And it's called The Price van Overleven, The Price of Survival. I can, I can very much rec uh, recommend those, those documentaries. Now, now there's a lot of books on, oh, there's Jan Bastiaans. There's a lot of books on psychotrauma, on landscapes of psychotrauma. And here are just a few that, that I want to share with you. Maybe you know this one, Peter van Uhl, who has been my boss or so for, for, for many years when he was the, the, um, the, the, the chief commander of the Dutch, Dutch forces when we were in Afghanistan. And this was in um, 2007 when his son, his son when he's in Afghanistan, he was just promoted to be the highest ranked soldier, officer in the Netherlands, and his son just got killed on the day that he was promoted. And uh, just very touching then, when you're a father and at the same time a soldier, what do you do when your son is killed on the battlefield where that, you're, that you're in charge of? And he wrote that book, I Chose the Weapon. Touching, touching uh, story. But um, books about the First World War, Orlog and Terpentine, and there's an interesting book that I want to show you here. It's called Trauma Sporen. Do you know the name Bessel van der Kolk? Mm -hmm. Who does know the name Bessel van der Kolk? Uh, all right, no. Trauma Sporen is a book. It's originally called um, The Body Keeps the Score. The Body Keeps the Score in the Netherlands called Trauma Sporen. <laughs> Bessel van der Kolk is a Dutch psychiatrist. And he moved to, uh, to Boston, uh, was at Harvard, and later at Boston. And if you just look at that book, and if you go to, uh, what is it, bol.com, I think, then this book, out of 59 reviews, get a 4.8. Pretty good, right? If you go to, uh, to Amazon.com, out of 1,800, he also gets a 4.8. I think it's pretty good if, if you go to the New York Times bestseller list. For the last half year, he's on the top five of the bestseller list of the New York Times. I didn't have a quote of that. If you want to explore this domain of psychotrauma or so, then I can hi highly recommend to, to buy this book. Uh, it's a very accessible book uh, where MDMA, which I talk about a little bit as well, in addition to other uh, approaches to, uh, to psychotrauma will be elaborated on. Now this is just, just a picture of something that occurs on on a, almost a daily base. Well, hopefully not on a daily base. There was a terrorist attack in New York. And if you look at this picture, this, this could occur, it could, this could be a, a, a life-changing experience for this guy. And you could think like, how will this guy remember that day in his life? Life will never be the, cha the same, probably, for this guy. Or, or for this guy, or for, or for him, or for, I don't know, him or her. Maybe, maybe not for her, because she may not have memories of, of what happened. And the question is, like, a question for me as a scientist and as a clinical researcher is, wow, we do not know how life will unfold after something like that has occurred. Um, and if we did know, could we prevent that life would turn badly or so, right? So. The challenge for us now as clinical researchers is what we call reconsolidation or consolidation of traumatic memory. Could we intervene <coughs> early enough to prevent these traumatic memories from reoccurring in their daily lives? Do we need to give them medication or so? Do we need to give early something or do we need to, what do we need to do? And that memory may be engraved in brain and in body. And especially when we have, um, when we have soldiers or policemen who are exposed to this on a daily basis, as an employer, it's very important to see if we can intervene early enough. It's called secondary prevention. What is the prevalence of potentially traumatic events? And let me just clarify if I go on in my lecture. We have events that can become traumatic 
but that in its potency are traumatic, like this one, or uh, witnessing injury or shocking events, sudden expected death of a loved one, are not traumatic events by itself, but they are potentially traumatic. And with potentially traumatic, it means that um, they may lead to lasting changes in somebody's life. When they lead to lasting changes in somebody's life, then you can, in, in retrospect, call them traumatic. But they're not traumatic in itself, right? So when I talk about potentially traumatic events, I mean that there are a range of events that can have the capacity to become traumatic. Miranda Olf and Kertjan de Vries looked at what is the prevalence of these traumatic, quote unquote, index events. And what is the prevalence of a disorder that's related to exposure to traumatic events? which is in the Netherlands, it's 7.8, which is almost triple of many psychiatric disorders, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. It's a very prevalent disorder. 10% lifetime prevalence in females and 5% less lifetime prevalence in men. That has to do with the exposure to traumatic events. It may also have to do with constitution, that females have a different stress-regulating system than men. Um, I won't elaborate on this paper, but I'll talk a little bit about PTSD. But what drives this PTSD, and the, sh the picture that I showed you is, um, is confronting the person who was there with his hands with the reality of the world that was, was highly uncertain at that time. Because there may be another terrorist attack. There may be burns or so. The, the uncertainty is, is a very a very vulnerable aspect. The uncontrollability is on the another aspect. When there's uncertainty, uncontrollability, and fear, the landscape may be very vulnerable for the onset of post-traumatic stress disorder. We live in a light, we want to know what's happening tonight, right? That, that's our brains and our cells are wired to be controlling our environment. We want to be home at night, right? We want to go home, have our friends and blah, blah. But if that's not certain that we go home, that we are captured or we're burned or whatever, then sh it conflicts our way of thinking about ourselves and the predictability of the world. So these factors may occur. Now we send soldiers to, to, to deployment areas and um, I've been there in Afghanistan in 2007, ISAF, International Security Assistance Force. We sent in the Netherlands 25,000 troops to Afghanistan In, with the idea that the world was a safe place, then we need to build and bring the hearts and the minds of, of connect with the hearts and the minds of the local people, right? And if you see that, it's a touching, a touching picture of this guy that kind of reaches out to this young kid. But we've also been exposed to impro imp improvised explosive devices. Uh, this war had a signature weapon, and the signature weapon was this. It was improvised explosive device, the, the, the blasts that occurred. And the Netherlands were relatively s relatively safe compared to other forces. We only, only had 26 what we call killed in action that were killed because of uh, an injury that occurred on the battlefield. We had over 130 wounded in action. But if you compare that to the Canadians and the Brits and other forces, they were much more um, at, at a loss. Sometimes uh, that, that can happen, where soldiers are killed on the battlefield. And it always discusses the political arena, did we do good going there, blah, blah, etc. But these are the guys that I see on a daily basis because of the, because of the suffering, because of the, the guilt that they have not been able to protect their bodies, or the nightmares that they have because of events that happened on the battlefield. That's my daily practice, where I see guys that are suffering from, from events that happened there. Or this guy, he allowed me to share this picture with you. He's standing here, he's, I think he's 21 or so, I can't exactly, but he was a young lad that was sent on deployment, former Yugoslavia, Porto Chari, it's close to Srebrenica. And this was 1994 and he made this picture. And, um, <coughs> and you see that kids at the gate. He was inside the gate and these kids were outside the gate. And um, what he told me, he said, Eric, I have these pictures, these two, 
and I cannot get these pictures out of my mind. They revisit me at night, and they're frozen in my nightmares. I see them all the time, these two girls here, and they're kind of begging or so, or throwing stones if I don't give them anything. And, uh, and you know what's bugging me, he said? Um, I feel guilty. And his guilt was that um, they gave him a lot of money at the gate. A lot of money because they said, well, I think we won't survive here. We may get killed in this war. If you go on an R&R, on, R on, on, um, R &R is going, going home for, for your um, R and R, what's R and R? Uh, re rest and rest and recreation. Then uh, bring bring it to our families, please. And he didn't. He wasted the money. And after the war was over, after he come came home, he started to feel not only be suffered by these these memories, but also by the guilt that he wasted the money that was so precious for these guys and girls. What do you do? What do we do when he comes to treatment? How do we help him to forgive himself? Or how do we help him to get unstuck or so, to can let go? Well, let go, or do you do exposure, or do you EMDR, or what opportunities would we have in our therapeutic hands to help him get unstuck? I'll revisit his case at the far end of my presentation. Uh, just let it go for now. Another, another picture of, of one of my, my patients that sometimes they are very talented and, and draw the pictures that they had nightmares of. If we look at the trajectories of people that suffer from PTSD, we can draw some interesting conclusions or make some interesting observations. Let me first focus on the left side of the page. Here. This is what we typically see if there's time here, and we have here the PTA, and you know what it stands for. This is potentially traumatic events. You're exposed to a potentially traumatic events, and what do you see typically? From a bird's eye perspective, when you look at cohorts, you see that there's a group that is resilient across time. You see that there's a group that is chronic on a, on a, on a PTSD symptom scale. And there's two others. There's one group that is showing high symptoms in the immediate aftermath, recover. And there's a group that shows sort of nothing, but has a delayed type of presentation. Now this one fascinates me a lot. Because if we get the flu, we are exposed to the virus, and then 10, years, 10 days later, we get the flu, right? The incubation time of the flu is very mathematically but what is the incubation time of exposure to a potentially traumatic event? It may be half a year, it may be five years, it may be 10 years. We, we don't know, really. On the other hand, if you recover, this is, these are survival curves of people who have been exposed to potentially traumatic events. And then you see here different categories, accident, war-related trauma, and then you do with a survival analysis, you can see how many times, how many years, in general, it takes somebody to recover from PTSD. This one, purple, you see here, purple is here, accident. So the survival curve here is relatively, after five years, almost 90% have recovered. Whereas the blue line here, war-related trauma, or the red one, physical violence, the survival curve after 20 years is still more than half, this, half, half of the uh, population that is still suffering. So, so it matters what, what quote unquote category you belong for the chance of recovery. Now, I didn't tell you much yet about symptoms of PTSD. The realities, as my title was, realities of people who are suffering from PTSD. The left top one is the nightmares being revisited by these nightmares on a day, on a nightly basis, or twice a night, or once a week. And sometimes it takes five minutes to go back to sleep. Sometimes it may take an hour before going back to sleep. Sometimes there are enactments, and sitting in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the corner of a bedroom, don't shoot, and, or sitting on top of their spouse, thinking that they have an enemy that they need to attack, which destroys relationships, can be very, very frustrating and very, very disabling or 
this one is um, I don't want to go to places. I don't I don't belong to the society. N nobody can be trusted. I don't I, I don't trust anybody anymore. This generalization of the whole world is a dangerous place. Please leave me alone. Or panic attacks, or like if somebody comes in the door, fear that 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 they will come in with a with an AK-74 or so, or with with a bomb or very hypervigilant, which drains the system if that hypervigilance is always there, always on guard. And then typically what people do with PTSD is they self-medicate. Can't blame them, because drink something to fall asleep easier, but drinking twice, three, four times before you realize you're, you're actually at a, at a dangerous zone. And then the, the one that I didn't show yet is the where it becomes existentially compromising, where you feel like I should be, I should be killed on a battlefield. I don't deserve to live, and I kill myself rather than continuing to live. Which currently, as we speak, it's a very high problem. Is this survivor guilt, or I don't know whether it drives survivor guilt, but if you if you read the newspapers, the um, the suicide rate, not in the Netherlands, but in the U.S. Have you heard the numbers? It's 22 a day. 22 kids, relatively young kids, kill each kill themselves on a daily basis in the U.S. Well, it's a large country, but it's still is high prevalence. And it doesn't go down. We've been away from that theater, but still, it's still a, a, a sort of a, a plateauing number. So the reality of somebody with PTSD is a different zone. And the world is a different place. Now, I'll, I'll read this quote with you. This is a quote from... Uh, uh, you can look at it also biological or almost mathematical. And this is a, it's not only a beautiful woman, but she's a, a wonderful researcher, Rachel Yuda from New York, and Joseph Ledoux, who's also a great singer because he plays in the band The Megaloids, and he wrote a beautiful book, The Emotional Brain, that you may remember, that's him, Joseph Ledoux. They said PTSD represents a specific phenotype that is associated with a failure to recover from the normal effects of trauma. It is a specific phenotype that is associated with a failure to recover from the normal effects of trauma. When I teach about that, I typically say, well, okay, here's an individual, and here's the incoming trauma. And the incoming trauma does this. It knocks you off your socks. But after a while, you bounce back. And the ones that bounce back are resilient. And the dominant, the default position is we're resilient. But the ones who are not resilient get stuck kind of here or get stuck kind of here. And they have that kind of failure to recover from the normal effect of trauma. You can look at a cortisol. You do cortisol and you stress a rat or a, pr an, a sort of a, an animal or so, and you see how, how cortisol can come back to baseline. It's a way to you also can sort of think about stress and what is the amplitude and the area under the curve and the speed of recovery. That's kind of an, uh, also an, an, a way to do research in this domain. A lot of research has been, has, been, has been done that way. You could look at um, <coughs> how that can be superimposed on these two people. And do you know these two people? Well, you may not know them or so, but you may recognize this picture. Sometimes people do recognize this picture. Who, who, who? Sorry? Zaventem. What happened in Zaventem? Yeah, it was a terrorist attack a couple of years ago, right? And if you look at it, it's just, I was chatting with some people and said, well, it's interesting that she is sort of sitting as if she has no orientation or what's her next move going to be. Whereas the left lady already has the phone in her hand and sort of seems to be very proactive. I know what ne my next move is going to be. But the, 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 the point that I wanna make here is in both of these women, their fear and their stress regulatory systems or their amygdala is uh, highly alert, highly activated. The frontal cortex, their amygdala and their hippocampus, drivers for a stress response are very active. Where can I go? What's safe? What's unsafe? What's my next move? And do I have enough energy to make the next move? Or are my legs frozen? Or, or am I, have I a bro broken leg and I cannot, can I go to the exit? Where is the exit? So the appraisal and spatial are at a very high alert. And then you'll see an outpour of hormones that actually drive this response. And this is fine if that happens, right? 
But if two months down the line or six months down the line or two years later that system is still with a relatively minor trigger activated, then they're at a loss. Here you see a picture, maybe, maybe you recognize my way of talking, and it's like, what is he trying to convey, <laughs> right? So if you are at that moment, like, where, what is he trying to convey? I have these islands of things that I wanted to bring to you, and here's an island, here's an island, and then sort of later, as we speak, it sort of merges together. So here's a picture of a, here's a Vietnam veteran in a scanner. And maybe you do recognize this one that's not that often used in clinical research. This is a PET scanner. And a PET scanner is typically used where you see here, you see uh, that he can put his arm there, and typically we can inject a radioactive substance, for instance, water with a short half-life. And there's a person reading a script to this person. And this is a paradigm that has been very well frequently used in PTSD research. It's called script-driven imaging script-driven imaging. So somebody has an index trauma, and they tell the trauma to, to the clinician. Uh, I was driving in a Bushmaster, and it was Sunday at 5 o'clock, and there were three vehicles ahead of us. And all of a sudden, the, the, the most, uh, the most uh, distant vehicle moved to the right, and there was an explosion, and that whole story unfolds. The person is reading that script to the, to the person in the scanner. They relive the trauma, and at the time of the reliving of the trauma, they inject radioactive water, and you can see what happens in the brain. And we got a lot of information out of that paradigm, and that paradigm has showed us what's happening with when somebody has a flashback. Well, this, this happens when somebody has a flashback. Who wants to give it a read? Who wants to give it a try? What happens when somebody has a flashback? There is a, what can you see? There is a, it doesn't read in the text. There's a failure of activation of the medial prefrontal cortex. The medial prefrontal cortex should, in that particular circumstance, tell the amygdala that is conditioned to the fear response, you're not in a Bushmaster now, you're here in the scanner. But the reliving is so active and he is so engaged by a absence of inhibition at the fear condition amygdala. So this is replicated over and over, and this is what drives people with PTSD nuts, because their me me medial prefrontal cortex is not on board enough to tell them that they're not there where they think they are. But, but it seems very active, but it's not very active. No, it's not active. This is, this is not active. It shows it's active. the opposite. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is, well, the whole thing is a subtraction analysis with comp con controls. It's absence of activation. Oh. <laughs> You would think, well, they may have already had that before they went to, to, to Vietnam or whatever. And it's a beautiful research paper recently, diminished medial prefrontal cord activation and during reco recollection of stressful events is an acquired characteristic of PTSD. So it wasn't there before, it's after. Another line of research that we've learned a lot from is, um, is from this. Who wants to give this a try? What are we looking at? No. The yes. <laughs> this is the hippocampus. And this is actually when, when, um, when uh, Clinton was uh, at the White House, this was a picture that was shown to Clinton. Not my picture, but it's a picture of where I was at Yale at that time. And you see on the left, you see a, a hippocampus <coughs> from a healthy control. And on the right, you see a hippocampus of somebody with PTSD. And the hippocampus of somebody with PTSD is smaller. You can say, well, what's the heck of that? It's a very, <laughs> it's a very highly scientific observation that um, actually shows that stress and traumatic stress has a, 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 um, a, um, an impact on the brain structure and it shows dendritical atrophy. Um, and, and well, I won't dwell on that in detail, but that's another important line of research. Before we move on, just a, a let me see if, if, if I can make this move. I think yeah. That yeah. I want to show you a snapshot where we are now in time. It's not so, are we okay with time actually? Because I still have, it's, it's wonderful to see how, how, how this interaction goes. We're good? Yeah, good. Uh, a brief vignette of like three or four minutes. Do you know Hutus and the, Go Hutus and the Tutsis, what happens? 
it's a long time ago, 1993, right? The Hutus and Tutsis were killing each other. The Netherlands sent 126 soldiers to, to, to Goma. It was a humanitarian mission. The Canadians were the lead nation there. And I'll show you just a snapshot what PTSD can look like, <coughs> and just because of their verbal repertoire. And I want to highlight on this guy who is going to talk in a minute, and he was Romeo Dallaire. You know, Romeo Dallaire was the general who was in charge of the, the deployment in, Hutu, in, the, in, in Goma, and he talks about something that he suffered from a lot, the loudness of silence. I'll let it play, and I'll tell you what he means by this. Uh, later. Oh. oh. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, I figured I'd like do my job, you know, it's my job as a medic to come back and uh, I just carry on. But uh, you couldn't carry on. It affected my wife, it affected me, my, my family. Um, it was really hard. Um, and there was no support there. That's the worst thing, I think, of being a Canadian soldier, is that a uh, uh, weakness is, is frowned upon. So, uh, the easiest thing to do is take everything, push it to the side, pretend it was a movie. And it isn't until you get hit by uh, smells, the smells are the worst, that it'll trigger a memory. And then it's like a film starting up in your head. And either you can let it run through or you can push it back into that spot. Their foods can't eat anymore. Uh, grilled chicken, candy, looks like a dead body. Uh, their vehicles, uh, that I see, like rusted vehicles, can't go near them. Uh, children, I have the time, I have the time looking at little kids, especially uh, newborns, because they were uh, a plaything for the Hutus. We really like killing kids. Well, I have not expounded on the treetops or the, the houses. Um, but I have only gone 10 months of therapy. And it didn't hit me right away. It took nearly two years to all of a sudden not being able to cope, not being able to hide it, not being able to forget it or to put it in the, keep it in the drawer. And I became suicidal because there was no, there was no other solution. You couldn't live with the pain and the sounds and the smell and the sights. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't stand the loudness of silence. Sometimes I wish I'd love. I couldn't stand the loudness of silence. Now, to put it in perspective, what does it mean? How can you not tolerate the loudness of silence? Silence is absence of sound, right? So when at night, <gasps> at night it was silent, the killings happened. And he knew that, because the next morning he was awake and all the, ki all the whole village was, was slaughtered. So, so the loudness of silence was a precipitating, the silence was a precipitating factor for him, like the, there's a killing now. So at night when he came home, he couldn't sleep. He couldn't sleep. This frame that I just showed you, and as we've been talking, this is how patients with PTSD can get stuck, right? And this is not only for military. This could also be for sexual abuse. This could also be for assaults, index trauma. And now there's a big conference in Rome, right? The sexual abuse in the church, that people with, with, with these memories for years can be haunted by these same things that can be incubating themselves and leaving, leaving these clinical phenomena. Now you already saw the next one. Why do we need to know all this, right? I thought this was about MDMA, right? <laughs> or psychedelics, so what the? Well, I think, yes. Or 
well, maybe not necessary, yes, but if you're interested in this from a, from a, from a clinical, or which is my arena, then we need to know this because it provides the framework, it provides a framework for understanding where these individuals are. <coughs> knowing the realities we live in and knowing the realities that individuals or patients after so tra psychotrauma live in is critical for the ability to connect. And my job is to be able to connect to help them to dance, right? And to see if there is a reality that is better or different or with less suffering. And what we need to do is provide an opportunity for another reality that is less harmful or less destructive or less dangerous. There's not one reality. We all have different realities. That's kind of a no-brainer, right? So. There was a time that PTSD was a death sentence for a soldier. There was a soldier years ago, he said, so stabiel als beton, so zie je maar wie praat die gaat. This was a guy who was in former Yugoslavia and he was talking and the talking really helped him to recover. And he was glad to be a soldier. So he was happy that he was treated for PTSD and he recovered from PTSD. After having been in therapy for a year and a half, he could back to, he sent, he sent his postcard from Kabul. He was happy, he had a lousy deployment, and now he had a deployment that he was proud of. You can be proud of a soldier where you do good things. Yeah, verandert ik, lul ik niet. Sometimes there's like stigma, and you know, I don't know, I don't want to go there because I'm a wimp if I acknowledge that I have PTSD, so. And not, not, not in, in to, but what we're talking about has been, uh, we're talking about now PTSD, PTSD, but we're also talking about shell shock, from the First World War, or the Cita Neurosis, or Le Foie de la Mort, Traumatic Neurosis, so many names that this landscape has been known to us. And now, if you read literature or popular, popular journal, moral injury, it's like what we hear about as well a lot. What is moral, we don't know, but we don't really know. So, what do we do if, this is the landscape, right? What now is the clinical arena? Where do we provide, and in my, practice, it's praten en pillen, right? So it's psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy. Like in the psychotherapy, we have a lot of exposure therapies, cognitive therapies, we have eye movement desensitization disorder, uh, reprocessing. We have another one that's 3MDR, we have narrative exposure, we have virtual reality, we have gamification, novel approaches to therapies. We have pharmacotherapies where we give patients SSRIs, stress-stickling and mood stabilizers, beta blockers, atypical neuroleptics, and we have novel others. And you sort of feel already where now finally where this might be going, but not yet. Can I ask something? Yes, go ahead. I completely missed the somatic experience. Like the tissue is, the issue is in the tissue, like the cervical ceiling or this. Like in the treatment that there's only talking <coughs> or pills, but where's the feeling? It's not there, right? It's not there. No, it's a very good point, actually, because this is kind of dichotomy, but there's a lot of in-between where um, we call them, these are verbal therapies. These are verbal therapies. And what you may be aiming at is like the non-verbal therapies, like psychomotor therapies and, and yoga and mindfulness. Embodiments. And body, yeah. Crucial, but, I guess. But but if you look at this from a, let me, I'm, I'm a researcher, mm -hmm. so if you look at it from an evidence-based perspective, mm -hmm. this is what we consider evidence-based, mm -hmm. whereas there's also a lot of therapies that are not evidence-based, but are widely used and highly appreciated. So this is from the view of evidence-based? It should be evidence-based okay. <laughs> at the top, Thank but you're you. very <laughs> right. It's not okay. all that there is to it. EMDR, you may know that, is very popular and who, who, who is familiar with EME and DR? See, that's, it's, it's wonderful. I'm wonderful in a way that, that 10 years ago it was very not known. It's very, very successful for what we call single type trauma. It's, it's like a single type trauma is something with a beginning and an end, not repetitive trauma. And then after a couple of sessions, if then you're asking somebody to retell their story, they feel like, I can talk about it without crying. I don't have to avoid it anymore. It's not just there when I revisit it in my memory which is then very, and this is Abde Jong, who has pioneered that in the Netherlands. That's great. Sorry, so, so for complex trauma, you would say it works with that? Yeah, for complex trauma, it, I wouldn't say it doesn't work, but it doesn't do the job like it does for simple trauma. 
Now we have several evidence-based treatments. Don't want to dwell on that. I don't want to dwell on this one either. <laughs> so, but before we move to the next phase, is what are the trends in the landscape of psychotrauma tology? The trends that we see have is how often do we need to have treatment? Once a week, that's kind of the traditional mode. We go to the therapist once a week. But maybe, oh, this is in Dutch. Maybe we need to be re revisiting that concept. Maybe twice a week or so, or three times a week, or twice daily. It's something we're challenging at this moment. Maybe we need to do, like you said, combine these verbal and nonverbal therapies and psychomotor therapies, not only sitting in the therapy office and being re-exposed, but also climbing trees, doing something fun, mindfulness, yoga. Mm. A lot of these modalities are very interesting now to revisit or visit. Mixes of therapists, like maybe you can be my therapist in the morning and you can be my therapist in the afternoon. You can be it on a Wednesday, you can be it on a... Do we, do we need to have that rapport with one single therapist or could we live with multiple therapists? Something we are also challenging. Mindfulness and acceptance and commitment therapies and modalities that are blended. Immersive virtual reality, uh, head-mounted displays are very prevalent. We see them a lot in games, gamification. Remote therapies where we do internet and assisted therapies by the web. And then we go to medication. We have medication-assisted therapies medication assisted therapies and now you feel like okay this is the landscape now he's going to talk about mdma <laughs> <laughs> but before we go there when we go to medication assisted therapies what do we want to treat do we want to treat a symptom or do we want to treat the disorder like we need to look into that are we uh, symptom he says based on facilitating a process do we focus on reconsolidation, like the guy who's exposed to the terrorist attack? Do we want to facilitate extinction learning? Or do we want to facilitate new learning? And there here, here are already two compounds, but we'll explore four other, two others as well. MDMA might be a very, a very good candidate in that. Ketamine might be another very good candidate in that. What do we know about this? The, what do we know about this? How can we help? patients connect with a world or a reality that they've lost confidence in or have lost touch with. It's, that's a way, it's a metaphor to describe how the therapy can unfold itself. We can divide it into psychopathological domains, but I am a proponent of a connection theory. How can we help people to connect and how can we, I mean, they have been disconnected from others. They don't want to be here. They can't stand here. This is too much of an audience. How can we help them to connect with others? Connection is what we need. Using the ability to listen in and respect the other or the altered reality, be interested in, tune in and co-create a new reality of use or use that may correct the old one or provide a new frame of reference. Provide a new frame of reference. The world is not a dangerous place. People can be trusted. How can we help people to trust again, to trust somebody else again? It's a very basic notion. I lost confidence in the trust in others. How can I, how can we help to change that landscape, to change that reality. Then you need to do something, not just a eye movement, it's a sensitization, reprocessing, it's, it's too profound. This is a figure from a poster that actually Erin, Erin Kredit here, um, and, 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 and myself, we proposed to the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology in December, where we look at the number of clinical or preclinical studies by four compounds in the treatment of PTSD. And we look here at classical psychedelics. We look at MDMA, ketamine, and cannabis. And if you see, if you block it out from 2000, 2004, 5, 9, 10, 14, and 15, 18, you see that except for the classical psychedelics in the PTSD, there's an explosion in particular in studies on MDMA, ketamine, and cannabis. Enormous. That's not clinical studies in general, but preclinical studies as well. They're not all empirical, but you see an interest, which is also reflected by the fact that you're here for this lecture. There's an interest in these compounds, in psychotrauma. We're not talking about depression or other psychiatric disorders. We're only talking about PTSD. This is one, cannabis. <coughs> and we're, we were the leader in cannabis in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, but we're hijacked or so, or our Canada is now by far the leader in medical marijuana in the world. Israel second, 
and uh, America is sort of third, and we're maybe fourth. But we have a very good regulated body for dispensing medical marijuana with the Bureau of Medical Marijuana in The Hague. And a company like Bedrocon, yes? In your, in your graph, do you see growth for these ones? Do you have an explanation for that? Yes, I do. You want to hear it now? <laughs> okay, I left the slide out, but I'll tell you, because it diverts a little bit, but it, since you're asking. Um, um, f in the field of PTSD, there are only two medications that, are, that have the indication PTSD, which is sertraline and paroxetine. For, and the, 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 these two medications were um, approved in 2001. We're now 2019. For the last 18 years, we have not had another medication that has been approved by the FDA or the EMA for the treatment of PTSD. Second is the medications that we are using are off-label medications that we borrow from other indications, depression. Typically, when I see a patient treating with SSRI and they read the, 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 the Beisleiter, they say, well, doctor, I'm not depressed. I have PTSD. So the medication we borrow from other disorders. I'm not, I'm not crazy. You give me an antipsychotic. Um, third is we see that the effect sizes of the current studies using these compounds are in some way are dropping. They don't seem to be sustainable in their effect over time, like they were initially. Fourth is there are no new compounds. If you look at the opportunities from in, no and well, for, 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 fourth was for uh, there are no new no new compounds that are on the market being trialed for the treatment of PTSD. <coughs> and fifth is the the industry that has been very dominant in psychiatry in general and driving actually. The, 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 the opportunities for new treatments has backed off. Uh, Novartis, uh, Glaxo, they, they, they leave CNS because there's much more money to make in, in vaccinations. So you see a diminished interest from the industry to even put efforts in trying to find new compounds. So then, that may be a long haul, then we need, what compounds did we miss? What compounds did we have at our hands that was golden, but we made them illicit because we put a ban on them. In 1986, we said they're class one drugs that we cannot use, not even in research. We can just not use. So I think the absence of this landscape, no, no new medications, help uh, is sort of a, a driver for looking back at the opportunity of revisiting old compounds that we had in our hands but has sort of alienated from. When I was doing my residency, I had, I had no idea what MDMA was. Ketamine, I had no idea because it was for anesthesiologists. So only the last five years or so, I feel like, hey, gosh, there's something that, and medical marijuana, it was kind of, if somebody was talking about marijuana, they felt that they were criminals. So a lot of psychiatrists don't talk about medical marijuana in their offices because, and patients are afraid to talk about marijuana because then they think that the doctor will stop talking to them. Now, I invite them, like, bring your joints on the table. How, how, <laughs> how sick are you rolling your joints? Like, how much, where do you get your money? Are you using sativa or indica? I'm learning that. It's very important to build that connection, right? And, and that's, whoa, wow, now I don't get any mind nightmares anymore. So, so don't criminalize it. But, so that's part of the answer. And there's also the imperative to do more research. And this slide shows a review on marijuana and other cannabinoids as a treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. It was reimbursable for PTSD. Now it stopped to be reimbursable because there was not enough evidence. We don't have the evidence. We need to know CBD, THC, how, how much CBD and THC does need to be in, the, in and, and I don't want them to smoke necessarily because smoke is bad for your health. So, but we've got oil, we've got vaporizers, we've got all kinds of opportunities to give medication to them. Actually, and this is a, uh, this is not, three, four years ago, a colleague of mine, he's uh, Rakesh Jetli, he's a colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces, did the first study, a small study, and that's 12, on the use of medical marijuana in active servicemen in the Canadian Armed Forces, showing that it reduces nightmares, and it re improves sleep, and it reduces irritability. Now it's an NF12, but it was the first study in an active 
service group of soldiers. Not that that changed the last but it contributed to the credibility. Let's look into this. And, um, and actually, this is what you get, right? From Betacon, you get floss or so, and you can, you can, you can get it. And you can prescribe it. It's, it's not illegal. Any, any psychiatrist or and neurology uh, and, and epilepsy is being treated since some forms of epilepsy are cured with the use of medical marijuana and, and end of life. And, and there's, there's a, a wealth of opportunities for us to look into, and um, and I, and I would like. There's also an industry to this. I was in Canada in Edmonton, and there's a couple of young guys who are actually buying land to grow marijuana. And it's very difficult to grow marijuana because it's a it's a natural product, and you need to stabilize right light and water, blah blah. And if you want to grow big plantations, you need to have a lot of land, and it's winter there, so you need to feed a lot of energy in maintaining the same climate for these plants and making it a good a good product. And if you look at what, what ointments and lubricants and stuff that is going to be on the market and the stocks that are now soaring to, to incredible high, high amounts, it's, it's mind-blowing. Mind There's a lot of money that's going to be made out of medical marijuana that we don't even aware of. Later, there will be Ajax or I don't know what sports club are going to provide ointments for muscle relaxation or so in the market with CBD. I mean, that's going to happen. And there's probably a couple of wise young startup companies that are going to make profit out of that. That's fine. That's fine. But we need to have the evidence in the medical arena that it's helpful. And we need to provide the research. There's just the first research study that is just completed last, actually yesterday, a MAPS-funded study that uh, took about two years or three years, Erin? Oh, the two, two, three years. It cost of two million, funded by MAPS on the use of medical marijuana for treatment of PTSD. It's going to be published in the literature shortly. There was a question. I'm going to this question later, but I wanted to know how do you combine this, the need for evidence-based um, medicine with the fact that some treatments maybe uh, affect differently different people. Like there's different individuals who respond differently, and so maybe the effects die through the way. But there's still a very strong effect for certain diseases, for certain types of Maybe I'm not following the first part of your question. Uh, so we need evidence-based treatments, obviously, but uh, different individuals may respond. Maybe uh, maybe cannabis <coughs> works very well for someone. Oh, but yeah. it doesn't work at all for Oh, absolutely. Else. We have our own CV. Right. We, we, the statistics, but we don't know. Like, in my caseload, I, I invite patients to be on medical marijuana, some smoke, some... But some, actually, maybe, but this is all anecdotal, more than half of them like to continue, even after half a year want to continue. There's some that don't want to continue after half a year. They feel like, hey, my sleep is getting worse again. So we need to look at for whom and what doses do we need to give more CBD. In, in the beginning, they all want to be high on THC. But then they taper off because they don't want to be high. They want to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So being high is not the driver maybe the first couple of nights or so or the for a couple of days. And they give it to their spouse. Oh, you want to take? That's fine in the beginning. The spouse stops taking it after a while because. So that's that's on cannabis, I think, right? So m more on cannabis is to come. But this is a, a a heat map of some of the companies, and I will I will go a little bit more on the MDMA. <laughs> there's MDMA, there's ketamine, there's classical psychedelics, and cannabinoids. Here are the categories that we can look into in the treatment of PTC. We can look at the therapeutic rationale for the provision of these compounds. We can look at the medication variable. We can look at the setting. Set and setting is very important for psychedelics. And what setting do we provide it for the different compounds? And what is the evidence? And this is part of the poster, Erin, that um, you helped us, us, um, us, us create. For instance, MDMA, the route of administration is an oral. Ketamine, we provide intravenous. Classical psychedelics, oral. Uh, the duration of action, four to 12 hours. 20 to 45 minutes, four to eight hours. That, that variability in terms of compounds contributes a lot to the opportunity and the setting that we have to create to provide treatment. A typical, a typical MDMA-assisted psychotherapy session lasts hours, eight hours. A typical ketamine, if there was a ketamine-assisted psychotherapy condition, would probably last an hour or an hour and a half because of the half-life <coughs> of ketamine. So the setting of 
ketamine for the use of ketamine-assisted psychotherapy would be completely different than MDMA. Uh, the setting in, uh, in ketamine, in, in, the, in MDMA, it's a clinically, but as maybe you can not read it in the back, so a clinically but aesthetically present room in the presence of two therapists, a male and a female, music to deepen and support the therapeutic process, embedded within a therapeutic treatment, non-directed, multiple non-drug preparation and reintegration sessions are the precondition to provide MDMA as the psychotherapy in. This one is probably most symptom driven. This one, I would think, I'm making a shortcut here and there, is not that beneficial for the treatment of PTSD. These two are very, probably very potential for the treatment of PTSD, whereas most of the evidence currently is in the MDMA. Why would you say that is? Why I would say that? Yeah. Let's pause that question and ask it in a few slides, right? <laughs> this, is a, this is a very, uh, well, it's a fun slide to show because it is being driven from a paper that was published in 2011 by, um, by Michael Miethofer, the first paper on the first randomized controlled trial on MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And when I was given this slide by Torsten Passi, a, a, a psychiatrist from Germany, and I call it new kid on the block, this medication. This is a placebo response of the MDMA assisted psychotherapy. MDMA assisted psychotherapy, this is the placebo response. After one session, after two sessions, after two months, and after three years. You see a drop on the CAP score of about 15 points, which is, if you look across the globe, not bad. But here's the response of MDMA. After one session, you see a drop from 80 to about 30 and a bit. The second session, this. After two months, this. And after three years, that's a very long follow-up, you see this. Now that is very promising, very promising. And typically the cutoff for PTSD is here. If the cutoff of PTSD is here, you can see that these guys here do not meet criteria for the disorder that they suffered from in the beginning. So MDMA, and I don't want to use that word a lot, you can cure people with MDMA as a psychotherapy. Is it that very interesting. two sessions or is it every week? This is the protocol. This is a protocol, this is the MDMA treatment yes. protocol. <laughs> I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you. This is Hyman Boston, who's now one of my PhDs who's doing, uh, who's doing the, uh, the, the, the theory. The, the dark ones here are MDMA sessions. And the protocol that has been used in, in that research was, here you have preparatory sessions, one, two, three, motivational assessment. You have here an experimental session with MDMA. You sleep over and you have another session the next day, not with MDMA, but a non-MDMA session. You have a seven-day chrono. You do an integrative session the next week. The next week, another integrative session. Then a month later, you do the second MDMA session. Same protocol here. And then you do a third experimental session. Again, with the same procedure as here and a long-term follow-up. Three sessions of MDMA are enough to show this effect. The typical dosages that they use here is 80 to 120, maybe up to 140 milligrams. That's completely different than recreational, what you typically can hear, 300 or higher. You do control for, um, you control for, for temperature and for a blood, blood pressure <coughs> be because that's one of the side effects of MDMA. Very safe compound to be used in that session, in that setting. Now, can everybody do MDMA assisted psychotherapy? No, according to, according to MAPS, which is Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Drug Studies, that are the leader with Rick, Rick Doblin, who is sort of the director of MAPS, you need to be trained. And like I said in the beginning, you need first to know the landscape of PTSD. And you need to know their reality. But you also need to know what to do and what not to do. And typically, I'm trained in exposure-based therapies. EMDR and the other ones are go back to that Bushmaster where you were, revisit the trauma, and work through, right? I will tell the patient where to go. Go back to your bedroom and relive the trauma, and, but now in a safe environment so that you decondition yourself. 
this, well, no, this one is non-directive. Non-directive is like, I don't have to tell you where to go. You know better than I do. I'll just follow. You just dance, right? I follow, which is something, I'm just, I'm just with you. I'll be with you as you, as you make this kind of movement to show you in a kind of a metaphorical way what you do. You're very important, but you don't have to tell where to go, which is something we, we, we may be uncomfortable with, but we want to tell people where to go in, in my medical domain. And we drive for something that has been reported in literature, we follow the inner healer experience. Wacky, <laughs> wacky language, right? <laughs> inner healer experience. <laughs> inner healer experience. Right, you have the wisdom of knowing where to go, and that's kind of what we follow. Yeah. Have you had any <laughs> 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 I thought you were going to ask, him, did you try MDMA? But not there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was the next question. Well, who hasn't? We, I mean, by default, we are, as human beings, we live in a world that we're, we're exposed to potentially traumatic events. Yes, I've had a few, and in, in my life, for my last 56 years, there have been a couple of events. Is that interesting? But you're, you're asking that as a prelude for the second one, right? <laughs> well, maybe this picture might help, but, but, but I'm, I won't ignore the question, but I'll come back to it. This is a group of MDMA assisted psychotherapy tr uh, clinicians. And they're called MAPS? They're called MAPS. MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Drug Studies, who is, is headed by this guy, Rick Dublin, as the director. This is Annie Meethofer, and this is Michael Meethofer, who are doing the training for people who are interested in doing these kinds of therapies. And these are the people who are being trained. They are cur currently from Center 45, because Center 45 and the GGZ Beilen are the drivers for this new like, like George said in the beginning, for uh, the trial that we are starting. Hopefully in the next mm -hmm. month or two, we've come a long way of doing all the certification and blah, 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 to give the first MDMA to the patient with PTSD. I have a question. Yeah. Who is funding that? Who is funding that? Is that MAPS? That's MAPS that itself. Is? MAPS has, over the years that MAPS has, uh, 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 has been around, <coughs> they have been able to fund uh, studies for 70 million. They've collected 70 million uh, dollars, and in the last couple of years, they have uh, uh, collected 25 million to be able to fund studies that are needed for the approval of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy as an indication for the treatment of PTSD, which drives me back to your question. Here we may have an opportunity. We had only two. This may be the third one that we'll have in our hands that has an indication that's FDA approved and EMA approved, it's a European medical agency, for the treatment of the disorder, PTSD. And practically speaking, this uh, MAPS contact Section 45, for example, or this uh, Section 45 reach out to MAPS, how does that work practically? It's interesting because I was, I was sitting in the audience at the American Psychiatric Association a couple of years ago, and there was that guy, Rick Doblin, who was giving a talk and, uh, about psychedelics, and all of a sudden he mentioned Jan Bastians. And I was in the audience, and I, I know that guy. <laughs> so I went up to him, and I said, can we talk a little bit more about what you're actually doing? And Jan Bas, he said, I'm going to be in the Netherlands. In two weeks from now, let's have dinner. So we connected, and we talked, and that actually led to, you know, we were right on time for the whole opportunity of being trained, and we have now the trainers, and we are doing now the phase three trial in the Netherlands. Are we good? Still five minutes, I think, then, then, then we're, it's warm in here. Am I the only one that's kind of warm? <laughs> well, this is, this is the setting, and, and I had a clip of how a therapy would, 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 would unfold, but since it's recorded and I cannot know where this will go, so I won't show the clip, but this is the setting. And the setting is that there's a therapist there and there, and this is a, a typical setting, and the patient is sitting or lying on a bed or a couch or whatever. You, I mean, you don't have to sit opposite of each other, but they're typically two therapists. Session lasts long, eight hours. Half-life of MDMA in that dose is about four, four, five hours. If we stop recording, can you show the clips? Mm -hmm. I think I deleted it from this deck or so, but I d my, it, it can be shown, but what you, what you show, I mean, typically what you will see is that there's a, a veteran 
that has just received his first dose, and you'll see him what he describes. And you see what, what you can, and I make that point, is what, what the Meethofers also say, is he revisits his trauma, and he has a quote-unquote corrective experience. And corrective experience is what he, what, what, for instance, what he would describe, he would say his trauma was that he was so guilty for having not having been able to protect his buddy who was burned next to him in his Bushmaster. And there was incoming fire from the, from the Taliban and they had an explosion, an IED attack, and, and the, the, the vehicle was on fire and uh, his buddy called Seabass, he couldn't, he couldn't save him and he suffered from the grief and the mourning of not having been able to recover. And what he does is a corrective experience. He so, well, what I do is he sort of kind of dissociated from himself and he revisited the trauma. Not in a typical way that he become fearful and anxiety prone and, and very agitated like in the old days that he would revisit his trauma, he would be very agitated and have a high blood pressure and blah, blah. Here, he would revisit his trauma with a set, sco a set score, which is a non-activated brain. He could revisit his trauma as it was reoccurring at the same time without feeling anxious, without feeling the same fear as he felt before. So he could reprocess it in a neutral kind of way, in a healing way, in a recoverable way. And that is what he then revisits. And I think, yeah, the phenomenology of what you see him doing is, it's my interpretation, it's beautiful. Therapy can then be beautiful. It's not a suffering, it's a beautiful way for himself. And you just sit there to help him uncover what he's been suffering from. And at the same time, because that, that's not all, because there are five hours. But after he has peeled off that guilt in that session, he is able to revisit another affective memory, which is, why the hell did I need to go to Afghanistan? Because my, patient, my parents thought I was a loser. And I, and, and, and I wanted to compensate me and myself. I wanted to have another picture for myself. So I revisited me being a loser, which is like that's kind of an affective bridge. He first goes there, and after having peeled off that, in the same session he goes there. And typically that would take maybe half a year of therapy to, to do that in ordinary sense. He did it like here in like uh, just a couple of hours. Yes? I was just like to add that I think it's also much like thing. Ah, beautiful, absolutely, but much less painful. And it's not always less painful because there are parts that are, in the reintegration session, he was lashing out to his wife. He was very active, so he, he was reapproaching himself from a different perspective. And he had to sort of reconcile with himself, with his angry <coughs> part and his protector part, if you want to call it that way. So this is typically the session, the setting. It's a relatively non-directive supporting the patient's emerging experience. Some periods of reclining, headphones with music, it's very much music driven, because you listen to music and eye shades if you want, and if you want to talk, then you remove your eye shades and music and you start to talk. And, um, and, um, and there can be long periods without talking, hours without talking, and you think nothing is happening, there's a lot happening inside. Because you don't go outside, you go inside. And typically when you use MDMA recreational, you go outside, you dance, you party, but here you go inside. Uh, you alternate, I see the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, I also heard That's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> I also heard that MDMA is used um, also for people who don't have access to their traumatic memories or only have their implicit memories, avoided memories. How does that work? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sort of not saying it's easy as if everything works. It's uh, hard work, and sometimes it's hard work for the person there who has difficulties to access. But mm -hmm. what I can say is that the ketamine is like a catalyst. It's like an invitation to revisit what you before were fearful of. It's kind of an, in well, this is a metaphor, an invitation to revisit something that you got stuck with. So it, it's, it's, it, it, ha it happens by, <laughs> it's so funny, it's, uh, it happens by itself. And it doesn't happen the first session, it's because you need to trust, because there's two people that you need to trust. And if you feel that there's a, not a lot of trust, the second session, it might happen <coughs> that you are able to revisit these memories that have been haunting you, but yet you, you have alienated yourself from. Are there also people, 
work? Yeah. 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 It's eighty three percent eighty three percent response. So there's seventeen who doesn't work. And what you can think of, we need to do a proper indication, and probably it's with people who are not having a very well personality organization, probably people with personality problems, borderline personality, maybe something, high dissociation, dissociative identity disorder, may have a struggle with reorient, reorganizing themselves. So they may not benefit enough from, from, from the MDA. It will not harm them, but they will not get the, 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 the benefit. But that's what we think at this moment. I think, but I don't have the evidence, but I think if there's ongoing uncertainty, like I said, uncertainty and uncontrollability, if that's ongoing, says you can do whatever you want, but you will get uh, maybe a little bit of symptom improvement, but, but you won't be able to be confronted in a reality that is safe and certain. So if, if you're back home as a soldier in a country where there's relatively certainty and blah, blah, then that's okay. But if there's ongoing trauma, it's hard to get the recovery that you hope for. Po po few se few sessions because then I, I want to make that point that the and then I'll come I'll come back to the question. MDMA allows processing of trauma without emotional overwhelming and with an increased recall. Then it's an imp a very importance of, of preparation integration. You saw three sessions. It's like well what the hell give that MDMA no. You need to have a very good motivational <coughs> readiness. Very good, not over expectations, but real expectations that you elaborate on. You take time for and then you re you you take the medication. So don't jump right ahead, head start with a, with a quick, quick and dirty sort of um, uh, start. I won't. So it's a different set and setting. It takes long, long in terms of we're typically used to settings that are taking 45 minutes and you're out. It's very personalized, it's non-directed, no exposure, it's inner directed. It's using, actually I use this term, it's the internal family systems as a model that we are different selves and we have you know, we have aggressive cells and we have protector cells and these cells can be in conflict with one another. And this model is used in the MDMA as a way to support healing. You can talk a lot about it, but that's the kind of the model. It's very humanistic. It's not po pointing, it's, it's cohort. It's slow therapy. Sometimes not, there's not a lot happening. When I show the, the picture sometimes to colleagues and uh, after five minutes say, well, that's not, I'm not interested in this anymore. It's so typically, you need to be able to tolerate that not much is happening, but there's a lot happening inside. So not everybody likes this, and that's fine. That's, tip, that's perfectly fine. You need to be able to tolerate that nothing happens. Same with psilocybin, right? If, you, if you're a sitter for psilocybin sessions, sometimes nothing is happening, which is very important you're still there. And, and don't drop your attention. Still be focused and be attentive because that's very important. You need to deal also with strong transference, right? There can be very strong transference, not easy for, for transference with, with negative transference or, or positive. So that's also something that needs to be built in into the training. Meaning making processing and effortless processing of traumatic loads. And I talked a little bit about the corrective experience as if you can revisit yourself in a corrective way, as if you're yeah, changing the landscape of how you've been able to look at yourself in the world and that the world is not a dangerous <coughs> place anymore after you've revisited it. Now, this was my session. <laughs> we, we are being given the opportunity to use MDMA in a scientific session and typically you get then the opportunity, you get, you get randomized, you get either placebo or you get MDMA. And I was in a session where I didn't know what I was getting, but this is a picture of my MDMA session where I get my, or it could be placebo, I don't know what, what, but you get any, I mean, if you have been given placebo, the next one is MDMA, or if you've been given MDMA, the next one is definitely placebo. Mm -hmm. And this was before, and this was after. <laughs> 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 this was placebo, well, right? Placebo. <laughs> <laughs> this was placebo. It's also a lot of fun. <laughs> it's fun to, no, it, it is fun to be, to be connected. And, and I, I didn't dwell on a lot of high symptom load of PTSD or so, but it's, and it's not mandatory that everybody needs to get MDMA. It's an opportunity if you wish. 
And I was given that opportunity, and it's a wonderful experience that I will never forget. That I got a lot out of, of, the, of me entering the landscape and providing the ability to have a nomenclature and a verbal repertoire that I can use for, uh, f for my interaction with, 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 with patients. And these are beautiful people, Marcella Otahora and Bruce, who, uh, who were the, 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 the guides for us. Sorry? Same thing, you get a bowl, and uh, you get a bowl, and then you take the pill that's in the bowl, and then you have a session exactly like you had if it had been MDMA. But it doesn't Eight hours. Does it affect the Sorry? It doesn't affect. Well, sometimes people feel that it's not MDMA. Mm -hmm. People who've been taking MDMA will recognize the difference. They will feel, hey, this is not MDMA because they feel something is absent. But you still have two people sitting there who are very attentive at you, and you have the music, you have the beautiful setting. So people may get a lot out of the placebo in itself. But MDMA is different. So what we do is uh, in the Netherlands, and um, we're following what's happening now in the USA. We're following the manual for assisted psychotherapy and treatment of PTSD. And there's now 16 active sites in North America. There's two sites in Israel. And there are seven European countries, out of which we in the Netherlands do now the bulk of it, <coughs> where we start with what we call an open label, uh, open label lead-in, which is um, we give MDMA in an open label to patients with PTSD where it's not placebo, we know for sure, it's not a randomized controlled trial, it's one, one, one session so that we, we familiarize the therapists with the setting and, and then we start with um, a phase three trial because we contribute to the data that are necessary for the EME, EMA, the European Medical Agency, to be used to get enough evidence for the indication of um, the treatment of MDMA for PTSD. And um, MAPS has collected a lot of money to do this in the US. And actually where they are now is that the phase three trial has just started, I think a month ago or two months ago. Interestingly that Israel, where we just were, um, has, I think it's on the verge of registration for compassionate use. Now what compassionate use is that you can give MDMA governed by the board of, um, by, the, by the Ministry of Health, uh, so it's legal in a medical domain. Um, and it's wonderful because then you can already give it in a clinical arena, helping people who are suffering from PTSD, but it will not help the, um, the European Medical Agency or the FDA to get to use those data for the indication. It's just compassionate use, which is great also in itself. And this is a training we just had in the Netherlands, uh, in, uh, in, the, in Heerland, and you see again, this is Rick Dublin, he was there as well. And we had 70 people out of different European countries who are, were part of that training. It's a week-long training where we look at videos and we work with each other um, to familiarize ourselves with this particular type of, um, of, of therapy. Uh, and we needed, we need, well, there's people from China, from Austria also. Most of them were from European countries. And um, are these trained professionals in something? Yes, yes, they need to have a background oh. in a mental health setting. They don't have to be psychiatrists or psychologists per se. We also have nurses mm -hmm. and registered nurses who can be trained as well in this, uh, in this uh, procedure. Now this is what we drew <laughs> as, a, as a group later. And uh, now, okay. Oh yeah. It's going to be a non-MDMA non story because not all needs to be treated with MDMA. But this patient of mine that I that I showed earlier is otherwise you think the whole world is and needs MDMA. <laughs> but this guy actually what he did he had these two pictures right, and uh, he wanted to know whether they were alive, and actually they are alive. And with the use of social media and Facebook, he posted these pictures on the internet a couple of years ago. And he got responses via different resources back. And this lady, this girl, these two girls are Elvira and Sabina. This girl is dead. She was killed in the war. But this one is Osman. And he brought his child. And 
You know, we were talking in the beginning about forgiveness, and we were talking about, about the frozen images and that how can you get stuck. He's now unstuck because he now knows also consciously and he feels it because he's revisited him a couple of times that life has moved on. They have, she's a mother as well, and I don't know about her, I visited <coughs> with him some rains on Porticherry last summer to see how connected that he is with, actually with the country that traumatized him and how beautiful it then can be that uh, it's a pilgrimage or so, I don't know whether it's a pilgrimage or not, it's a non-religious pilgrimage, but that, that helped him to carry on in his life in a, in a novel way. He didn't have any NDMA, so he didn't yet need it, but I just wanted to make that point at, at the end. So, in summary, you're extremely uh, patient audience because I've been talking for an hour and like 20 minutes, which is... <laughs> <laughs> In summary, what, what, what I tried to convey to you is that we trend from a rational, all the current therapies are pretty much rational, cognitive, to more experiential, like your question was not cognitive, but more experiential. MDMA is a very experiential uh, uh, therapy. Changing landscapes, why now we are changing the landscape? We may also change the mental health uh, uh, centers, because if we do this and this works or so, we may think of ways that the mental health landscape and the mental health setting is going to change. Maybe, maybe we'll have, and maybe, it's psychedelic clinics in, in the near future with a different, a different set and setting. Now if you go to a psychotherapeutic setting, there's these IKEA chairs and <laughs> kind of uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe we, 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 I mean, in Center 45, we're building one of these infrastructures. And uh, in Groningen and in Utrecht and in Leiden, there are psilocybin trials starting for the treatment of refractory depression. And if you look at that uh, uh, st setting, it's beautiful. It's, it's really beautiful. There are carpets and there's music and there's paintings. It's, 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 it's something that we're not used to typically. So several trends are visible. Uh, ketamines, cannabis, ketamine, MDMA, it will not go away. Don't think that this is going to be, it's a, it's a little bit of a hype and some of it will go away, but, but the research will probably be, be driving this and also the clinical evidence that is there will feed in. So. I think we're all young, young people, most of you, are, that in the next five years we'll see, I hope that there will be master courses on this and that there's new training opportunities for people to, to really have a different way of helping others. These are assisted therapies. It's not just take the drug and go home. No, we need to give the drug as an assisted form of psychotherapy. It's just a catalyst for the psychotherapy. We need to focus on the set and setting. So for psychedelics, we need to catalyze the therapeutic process. What is the mechanism? We don't really know what the mechanism is. We need to look into it. Is the amygdala less hyperactive after therapy? We're doing a neuroimaging trial here as well to see if that drives the evidence for the, for the, for the treatment effect. But we need to also <coughs> look at different paradigms. I mean, the way that we look at symptoms typical in our psychopathology, we may need to look maybe at different, different nomenclature and different paradigm for the treatment effect. Now, how to maintain an effect when this is upscaled in 2022? Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we n do need to know that we need to provide training. We need to have good therapists. We don't want to dilute it. If we give it away, then we might dilute the effect. So we need to have certified uh, uh, um, uh, therapists that, that, uh, that can do this. That, uh, and that needs to be regulated. It's all very new. <coughs> like I said, psychedelic clinics. When will the first psychedelic clinic be implemented in the Netherlands? And I predict you that's gonna be Leiden. <laughs> so I don't know, Amsterdam or like that. <laughs> I mean, there are underground clinics. A lot, there's a, a lot, I, I'm not a, unaware of that. There's a lot going on. But I think that we need to move to, 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 uh, to an, how do you call that, upper ground or so, where, um, where, we, where we do this. We need to keep high standards and training, and we need to integrate this into mental health structures. That's been a long haul. There's some, some questions that are still, still not answered yet. I think this has come to an end where I, I had the pleasure to engage you in first the landscape of tribal trauma, how people can get stuck. Uh, I've been talking about 45 minutes about that. I think that's important for the framework because if you understand a little bit about that framework, then you can appreciate how these drugs can help to get unstuck and how, how important, how different the paradigm is to look into the opportunity that we have for psychedelics to change the landscape. Uh, not back because it's never gonna be back, but better and to 
to, to allow people to grow again and to, you know, life is growing experiences and to be connected and to be really able to make friends and to have connections that were not possible before. Thank you very much for your attention.